live on Facebook. Ah, we are online, I see. That's great. Well, good evening, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on which part of the world you are. Uh, welcome uh, to this Connections Pod Talk uh, podcast uh, uh, with me, uh, Rob Brink. I'm an urban designer. I uh, work for the city of Amsterdam. Um, together with my ex-colleague, I should say, uh, Jared. Uh, Jared, can you introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Jared Krombeen. I am an urban uh, designer. Um, used to work for the city of Amsterdam. Now I work for the city of uh, The Hague. I'm also teaching at the Academy of Architecture in Amsterdam and um, are involved also in education. Uh, Rob will soon launch our uh, presentation. It's going to be a presentation. We try to keep it as short as possible. Rob is sharing his screen. We'll maximize the screen for you. Just a second. Here we are. And our talk is about revaluing the daily life. Um, yeah, we were asked to talk about this Corona situation. Uh, first, Rob will briefly explain what the Dutch situation uh, contains, uh, because the Corona was uh, treated a little bit different here in this country. We uh, were not in a total lockdown. And then we will share our observations and speculations um, with six themes, just random observations and uh, speculations. Um, some are really, um, really biased. Some things are more factual. Uh, we will hope to have a yeah, conversation with you afterwards, uh, but not before we uh, explain our co conclusion and what this could mean for, um, yeah, for the future. So maybe Corona has some impact for uh, our future values and how we value the city. Rob is going to take you to the first, uh, first aspect and uh, observations. Yeah, so uh, again, also as Jared explained, uh, we're really looking forward to hear about your questions uh, about the Dutch situation and our personal uh, opinion on it. Uh, but first, we're going to take you to uh, the situation in the Netherlands. Um, well, of course, as most people know, it started probably somewhere around December last year. But until the beginning of March in the Netherlands, nobody really bothered about Corona. Uh, everybody was cool and calmed down thinking it would not be a big, uh, big event here. Uh, that really changed halfway March when uh, Prime Minister uh, ordered a, a press conference ordering everybody to stay inside. This is what you see with our Prime Minister on the left and uh, the current Health Minister on the right. In the middle is the uh, uh, translator for uh, the, 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 the bad uh, hearing. Um, so uh, the uh, the, the, uh, when the lockdown started, the people really started to panic. Uh, they really started to hoard uh, food. Uh, and it seemed that this calm and down to earth uh, nature of the, of the Dutch people, it, it changed overnight. Um, cities became empty. Uh, uh, public uh, places became a danger zone. Um, there was a smart lockdown installed, uh, calling on the uh, how would you say it? Uh, calling on the uh, yeah, individual responsibility of the people to not go outside only if necessary. Uh, you didn't need a permit, uh, but you could get a fine if you couldn't uh, uh, explain why you were, would be outside. And always there was this uh, uh, distance of one and a half meter uh, uh, was required. Uh, uh, parks were still uh, left open a little bit, uh, but most of them were, were kind of... Uh, there was a limited access, uh, schools closed, uh, cafes uh, closed, all these kind of public places, uh, they closed. Um, uh, most uh, policies and decisions were made on uh, based on, on scientific research. Uh, so there was, it was quite a change. Politicians making solutions based on science uh, with all the skeptical ideas about climate change. This was a, uh, I would say, a refreshing change. Uh, also, it was uh, easy to uh, apparently uh, to uh, to allocate fundings to fighting Corona and also its economical uh, consequences. Um, and also, we made a really radical switch from uh, global free trade um, to a very nationalistic planning economy. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, the global economy closed. Um, 
it, it yeah it changed a lot for uh, for the Netherlands. Uh, it also meant that we uh, needed to focus more on our own neighborhood. Uh, people uh, were uh, not able to travel through the whole city anymore. Uh, their 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 space was getting uh, smaller. Uh, parents had to spend a lot more time with their children since the schools were closed, and. Uh, also, because our healthcare system was under a heavy pressure, um, I think most people in the Netherlands really started to uh, revalue uh, the importance of, of good public healthcare and good public schooling, because they saw how uh, how it's being put to the to the back of their feet uh, during these times. Um, so uh, now we go to the uh, uh, to yeah our, our more personal observations. Uh, the first observation is that uh, the image of the city has changed uh, drastically. Um, the city uh, became really empty uh, and people were able to reclaim some of, uh, of the public spaces. Uh, this is a street which was usually uh, full with tourists and other pedestrians. Uh, and now it was uh, suddenly uh, um, uh, okay to, uh, to, to sit there. So, and I have to be clear about this because they, these girls, they're not breaking the uh, Corona rules because you could still stay close to each other, close to the one and a half meter if you came from the same household. Uh, so they were still allowed to, uh, to sit like this. So that was a really interesting and refreshing change. Uh, and this, yeah, you see this in more places in the city. Um, but we also saw parts of the city that became quite empty. So this is uh, Beursplein. It's one of the more uh, crowded places in the city center uh, where the uh, economy is uh, mostly based on, on tourism. Uh, and you say before and after how, uh, how empty the streets are. Um, yeah, this, this part of the city uh, mainly uh, yeah, uh, functions on uh, yeah, kind of global tourist concepts. Um, it's, 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 it's mass tourism. Uh, it's a kind of uh, tourism you see everywhere in, in Europe. Um, and it actually doesn't really have much to do with Amsterdam itself, but it does uh, generate interest from tourism and it does make a nice uh, business case. But for locals, this is not uh, an interesting place to be. Um, and it also goes with the, the shops that accompany it. Um, if you would see how many pancake shops there are in Amsterdam, you would think that Dutch people only eat pancakes every day. Uh, but this is not the case. They, uh, they mainly uh, are based there for the tourists. And when they weren't allowed to get into the Netherlands anymore, uh, those places uh, all had to close down and uh, soon went uh, bankrupt. Um, and we also saw it on, on the public streets. Um, uh, the, the, the roads in Amsterdam are quite full, not just with cars, but mainly with, with bikes. Also the same with, uh, uh, with the parking spots for the, for the bikes. Um, so it became more uh, relaxed to take your bike and, and, and go around. Uh, there was not so much aggression anymore. Uh, and we could also sense that uh, in the city, you always have background noise, always the noise of the city. Um, but now with Corona, it was very quiet. You could hear uh, the birds singing or you could even hear uh, yeah, nothing, which is uh, quite, quite unusual. So um, now that the tourists and, and all the visitors are gone from Amsterdam, we have to, uh, and we have to find a way to open up the city again. Uh, we also need to take into consideration uh, who is being served by, by this mass tourism. Um, and what is it doing for uh, the living quality and attractivity of the city uh, that we're all looking for? Uh, what makes Amsterdam an attractive city? Um, yeah, so this, this moment is, is a really good time to, uh, uh, to, to try to find a new uh, balance, to, bro uh, to break down uh, the mono functionality of the city center and to make it, uh, yeah, and to introduce more sustainable concepts. Yeah. it? Don't forget your mic. I will introduce you to our second uh, observation um, because we think um, Corona um, yeah, created a new relation between the city, uh, traffic and the city economies. Um, 
and we uh, yeah we also would like to uh, evaluate maybe the 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 future value of uh, of the office uh, next slide so first of all um, yeah traffic got uh, got got uh, shut shut down um, there was way less traffic than normal and uh, road constructions happened way faster they uh, went beyond schedule because especially in the downtown area of Amsterdam, they're doing a lot of um, construction work, um, but all the constructions happen to be way faster than, uh, than planned. So this was uh, the first benefit maybe of Corona. Next slide. But first let's take you to the situation before Corona uh, and the infrastructure in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, the infrastructure of the Netherlands was uh, facing its limits um, both in uh, car infrastructure and public transport, um, the increasing amount of uh, commuters um, yeah, caused almost yeah, traffic uh, jams. Um, and yeah, the train companies even didn't know how, um, how to solve the issue for the future because uh, installing new infrastructure would be really, uh, really expensive. Um, next slide. And in terms of car, uh, the, 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 the amount of car traffic also started increasing. Before Corona, the Netherlands was in an uh, e economic boom. Um, the unemployment rate was the highest uh, or the lowest in, in years. So uh, that means we had a lot of uh, a large working force being active. And a large working force also means we have a lot of extra traffic. So the roads were, um, were getting blocked. And in some cases, like on the 11th of December, 2019, a few months before Corona, uh, there was even people were thinking that the, in, in some cases, the Netherlands and especially the infrastructure around cities would get uh, stuck at some points. And uh, this, this happened in, uh, in Rotterdam. Next. So this is what it would look like. And then we go to the next slide. Here we see what it was in, uh, in, in Corona time. So all of a sudden we have all this extra space. And why do we have this extra space? A lot of people started working from, uh, from, from home. Um, yeah, and th this, this gave a lot of uh, benefits, but also maybe some perspective of how we could deal with infrastructure in the future. Because what you see here is that office people when they start working from home or when students start working or studying from home and only meet when it's necessary, um, we can actually reprogram the existing infrastructure without expanding the existing infrastructure. Next slide. It also is not only the, uh, it's not only about the spatial impact infrastructure has, uh, I think uh, infrastructure also has a lot of impact on our health. And I think during the Corona crisis, we uh, clearly saw the skies getting more clear, the pollution being gone. Um, on the left side, you see what the pollution used to be. And on the right side, you see, you see uh, our traffic uh, system. But now in Corona time, um, we, we didn't have this pollution. We didn't have this, uh, we have the, didn't have this noise. So the real question is why were we always stuck in traffic and was were all our movements always uh, necessary to go to that one meeting or two meetings we have we could also do digitally so instead of moving ourselves and physically transporting ourselves we can maybe meet online instead um, and it will save us a lot of time on a daily basis it will improve our lives because also during corona we were still meeting up with our colleagues we had a home office, um, we just continued working, we switched in a different way of working, but at the same time, we had more time for cooking, to spend time with our kids, with our pets, or maybe do sports. Um, so for a lot of people, not being stuck in mobility, not having the noise and pollution was actually a great benefit. Next slide. So how did traffic really uh, got impacted. So here you see on the dark purple uh, all the different measure, measures uh, above and down below. You see all the casualties uh, and corona um, 
incidents going up and while the incidents go up, the traffic in uh, more the red color is going down. The uh, traffic pressure was reduced by 65%. So it actually shows how much um, yeah, overcapacity the road uh, had at that moment when uh, we reduced uh, so much traffic. Um, and I think this could improve also our living quality uh, a lot. So when we go back into a little bit more of a normal economy, we should really think about the future of the office. And if we take away people who are in offices and let them still work in, uh, in, our, uh, in our homes, uh, then we can get a major traffic cut and it will save us billions from spendings. Um, here you see the budgeting for the national government and how much they spent on infrastructure, but you also see how much they spent on economy and climate. So when this um, infrastructure spendings is being cut, you can actually reinvest that money in, uh, in different programs. So I think it's Corona showed us um, how we can deal in a more smart way uh, and a smarter programming with our infrastructure. And um, I think that could give us a, a real big uh, benefit. Next. Yeah, still the car is maybe in favor when it comes to uh, moving yourself in quarantine because it's the most optimal bubble to move yourself around. Um, next. But also we see that the, um, the bike really became in favor. And what we see here is um, um, bike infrastructure being rolled out. Now all the cars are gone. This is a movement that is happening worldwide, but it's something we already have in the Netherlands. So um, I think the Dutch people are moving around already a lot by bike, like Rob already showed. Um, but I think this Corona really gives the opportunity to rethink and revalue the public space and especially the traffic space because why are we still having so much traffic space for cars? And isn't the street not only made for, why is the street only made for moving yourself around and not spend time there? This is uh, an image of Rotterdam that kind of shows when you take out the, bike, uh, the, the, the parking for cars. Now all cars were gone in the city center. This space was reclaimed and reclaimed for the good. Um, and also to create the nece necessary space to keep one and a half meter away from other people. And um, I think this, it was also a short, sharp intervention that kind of shows how uh, we can deal differently with public space when we are not moving so much in cars uh, anymore. So uh, the value of our basic needs and the value of our neighborhoods. Um, well, we, now we will look at um, uh, yeah, how neighborhoods could work. Because um, since we started to work more digitally, it, it means we stay more at home and uh, it means we also stay more in one place and, and not use uh, the traffic systems as, uh, as Jared explained. Uh, but it also means that we also depend more on our uh, direct environment. Uh, so that's the space within one kilometer from our home. Um, and the outdoor spaces uh, close to our homes. Um, and there was this interesting, I think, discussion. Um, I'm not quite sure where it was, but it was uh, an architect stating that uh, now we should, uh, yeah, that every house should have its own private outdoor space uh, and that uh, every neighborhood should have its own uh, little park. Uh, that was quite surprising to us because uh, I think houses always needed that. It's uh, even a normal situation. It's ridiculous to think that houses didn't need it. Um, but of course, the, the, uh, the reason why we need them is, is, is more obvious than ever now. Um, but uh, yeah, during this crisis situation, we also need to think about how we can still use the park uh, without getting, uh, getting it unsafe. So this is a park not very far from my house where they uh, uh, painted uh, white and yellow circles to, to make sure people uh, keep distance. Um, and this is really the place where we had to do our exercise. This is the place when uh, and, and the moment we could go outside. And this is, uh, uh, yeah, uh, so these places uh, became more crucial than ever. Uh, we also got more time to meet our neighbors. Uh, 
people had to take care of the elderly because uh, healthcare institutions could not do it anymore. Um, the streets became safer, the air became cleaner. Uh, so that even invited us to get outside even more. Before a street or a park would be uh, unsafe uh, and now it would be safe. Um, so, and this is, I think uh, it, it's really important that uh, it was always important before, um, but uh, we have to keep uh, thinking about uh, uh, how we want to use our neighbors, uh, neighborhoods and how we can make it as, as pleasant as possible. Um, so, and this also brings us back to, uh, 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 to, to cities. Uh, good cities, I think, are a collective of, 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 uh, of good neighborhoods. Uh, but during a pandemic, the city is the last place where you uh, want to be because uh, all the benefits of the city, uh, living in the city, they are taken away. And it's the place with the biggest problem. Uh, so contamination when it comes to a pandemic. Uh, but I think it will still have a very important place uh, uh, in our life in the future. Because once uh, the crisis has been averted, um, uh, and the healthcare problems have been more or less solved, uh, then we are going to have to uh, rebuild. Uh, that means uh, an economical rebuild, because the economy is, of course, uh, hurting a lot. Um, but for people who lost their job during the crisis or who are still recovering from the flu, uh, it's important to be close to the places where those uh, services are to get a job or to get healthcare. Um, and uh, at first, you might also have to rely on, on social networks uh, to the neighbors uh, across the street who can help you with your uh, uh, daily health care issues or uh, a place in the neighborhood where you can find a temporary or even a permanent job. So uh, strong neighborhoods, uh, places with a strong social cohesion, I think they're uh, more important than ever. So I think the uh, city will, uh, will have a, a very important role uh, after uh, the corona. Um, so to conclude, uh, cities are still unhealthy places to live and we need to change that. Uh, but corona has showed us some opportunities. Uh, the neighborhoods we live in and uh, the streets we live at, uh, they have become quite essential to us and, uh, and especially the people who live in those places. Um, so, um, and we also notice that when uh, when you live too small or when the quality of your house isn't in order, uh, uh, then that's really uh, hurting your your, uh, yeah, your daily uh, well-being. So that's something I think, um, uh, especially designers, architects, urban designers like we, uh, we have to keep, uh, keep pushing for that. Um, uh, the, the, the economy will also be um, uh, evidently hurt uh, during a uh, crisis. And I think that uh, good neighborhoods will uh, 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 revive uh, better than ever if they're designed well. Okay, the fourth observation, revaluing the housing market and the value of affordable housing. Uh, that's the next point. Uh, Rob just already explained how important our daily living urban system is and how much we relied on it during the Corona crisis we were more depending on our neighborhood than ever. But um, in the Netherlands, and I will we'll talk, we'll talk not only about the corona now, but also more general issues we have in the Netherlands with housing, um, but also how corona influenced that. Um, I'll quick, quickly bring you in, uh, in how the housing market can be influenced by, uh, by, uh, by corona. Next slide. Housing, first of all, is a basic human need. Uh, it's in our constitution as the Netherlands. So that means um, also the government needs to take care of, of, this, um, of this need. Um, but in the recent years, we uh, had a thriving economy and a shortage of housing. Uh, this, this caused that uh, housing became a lot more expensive, uh, which shows in this slide. Um, so, um, this was considered a healthy housing market where uh, a lot of the initiative to make housing was at the market. So private investors would uh, make a lot of the uh, housing and we had social housing companies. Um, but there's a huge shortage and the shortage is mostly caused by a lack of governmental guidance. 
because from the 90s on the housing market was not a governmental task anymore so the market took over and started developing the housing since then there's a increasing amount of shortage in uh, in housing um, but also the government didn't feel the necessity to uh, to initiate initiate housing so this caused a huge crisis um, but also an immense shortage and an immense price increase so a lot of people cannot afford housing anymore right now there are 40,000 people, mostly starters, who are looking for a home in the Netherlands. Uh, 40,000 people in the Netherlands, that would be a mid-sized city looking for, uh, for new housing. And it's mostly due to those privatizations in, uh, in the housing market. So what we see here is that when the market is not taking the initiative, still a lot of people uh, lack from uh, having a house. So that means the capitalistic um, structure we are living in and the capitalistic uh, values are not creating enough housing for the people. So that means in, an, in, a, in a healthy situation with a good economy, there's still uh, a possibility of having such a shortage of housing. Next. Um, but now we face Corona and Corona will probably have uh, and will, will bring in another economic crisis. And the point is, is that the economy is probably about to crash by um, in between three or 14%, on average, 7%. They are, we, are, we are facing a huge crisis. But what happens if investors step back from initiating, initiating and funding housing? That means we still have a shortage of housing. So, here, this kind of Corona um, situation and the, 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 the sudden crisis that comes with it kind of shows us that in a capitalistic system, in a capitalistic housing system, um, when the market is responsible for making enough housing, nothing happens. And when there is a crisis uh, and still a need for housing, housing is also not being made because investors are pulling back because the um, the, the, the money is all, all gone in uh, stock exchanges. Um, so the conclusion we would like to make with this observation is that uh, the housing market shouldn't be depending on, um, on, on this economic tendency too much. I think we need a stronger uh, government and um, the corona situation and the crisis that comes kind of exposed uh, the, the, the fact we cannot, still cannot build enough housing uh, for people and we are unable to uh, to change the situation in a healthy situation but also in a crisis uh, situation so that of course also leads us to at some point to uh, climate and consumerism uh, and how valuable sustainability could be uh, after uh, corona um, so um, I think we've all seen these images and this uh, beautiful slideshow, maybe from the, from the Guardian, where you could uh, see how much air pollution has changed in uh, just a few weeks in, in places like India, where uh, suddenly you can see the texture of building again, or from your roof uh, uh, top house, you could see the Himalaya again. Um, yeah, so the, uh, just because of Corona, everything like this um, uh, yeah, happened in just a few weeks. It's, it's really amazing. Um, and the same thing we could see in, in the Netherlands. Uh, Netherlands is uh, yeah, in the, the economic center of Europe. So that means we're also in the most polluted center of, uh, <laughs> of Europe, you could say in a way. Um, but just uh, in um, uh, yeah, the difference in one year, it's, 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 it's really uh, huge. Um, a lot of uh, cars stopped driving, uh, some industries uh, stopped working, uh, airplanes stopped flying. And only some boats uh, uh, kept on uh, kept on moving, um, and uh, yeah. So a lot of people could also uh, see much more clear the uh, uh, the horizon. The, the, the sunset was a lot better uh, in the last few uh, few months because it was not uh, polluted anymore. Um, so uh, yeah, it was so good, uh, and we never had it before. Um, so are we able to live like this in a permanent way? Uh, is all this movement uh, uh, was it, does it necessary? Was it ne uh, necessary to pollute uh, our lands so much? 
Um, so, um, uh, and so, so what did we gain with the pollution? Uh, we did gain some things. Uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, global economy. There was a lot of trading. Uh, uh, it was possible to buy, uh, 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 yeah, uh, plastic goods from China, from the United States. While these things could also be uh, produced more close to home or maybe uh, transported to our places in a more uh, sustainable way. Um, also closer to home, um, uh, even closer, we could see that uh, the wildlife was coming back to the city uh, because there were no humans anymore, not so many cars. Uh, animals could really uh, go back to your doorstep. Um, so this is what we call a, a reiger. I'm not sure what the Dutch name is. Uh, but they, these animals you usually find around markets where they look for a little bit of fish. But since all the markets uh, were closed down, they really had to go into the neighborhood looking for food, which is quite interesting. If you, you wake up one morning and you look out your window and um, yeah, you see a reiger. Um, so uh, yeah, the climate and the young human life, uh, they're especially the, the, the winner of, of, uh, of this economic hold. Um, so it, it's, it's forcing us to develop a more sustainable way of living. Uh, and we can see how big our influence is on the, on the, on the environment. Uh, and if you can think about how much change uh, there was in such a short sh uh, time. Um, um, yeah, it, it, um, yeah we, we, we think that uh, uh, changes like this uh, could and should be made into a more uh, permanent. We would have never seen this. Um, uh, this change in environment if it was just to uh, to humans it might be uh, the corona might be the necessary evil to change um, so uh, to conclude uh, we hope that now uh, finally things have become clear what we could gain when we would stop polluting the world uh, it's, it's not very um, uh, easy to do but um, or maybe it is because we've seen it um, but we have seen the direct impact and uh, yeah uh, it's a, now it's a, it's a good moment to, to start thinking about how to change things so we can keep more of this. So the sixth and the last just random observation. Uh, Rob introduced this uh, theme already. Um, what will happen with the global economy and the global city concept? Uh, next. Yeah. Um, Schiphol is our uh, national um, international airport. Um, Schiphol was only dealing with 5% of the normal flights we would have normally. Um, so flights were just disappearing. Uh, but I think Corona also exposed how connected we are in the world. Um, from Wuhan to all world cities and New York especially with a lot of connections. Uh, the virus spread and I think um, it really showed how quick a virus can spread but also how well connected we are nowadays. I'm really curious what will happen with this uh, system now that a lot of air companies might disappear or when they have to make up for their losses and ticket prices go up. It might mean that we are, are going to travel way less, less internationally and maybe also meet more digitally instead. Um, especially for the trading and, uh, and, 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 uh, and business. Next. Yeah, so here you can see how much uh, change there was in the amount of passengers within, uh, yeah, within a year. Um, so like I said, it's on 5% of the, of the usual amount of, uh, of passengers, just in a matter of a few weeks, this whole market uh, collapsed. Um, there's a huge job loss increase there as well. Uh, a lot of jobs are relying on this, uh, you know, this, this, this global city concept and the connected concept. A lot of people in Amsterdam having their jobs at the, uh, the airport. All temporary um, people were fired. Um, they lost their contracts and they're now sitting home waiting for this market to start up again. But how will this market uh, start up again? And will all these global cities be connected? And uh, will the tourists uh, flush Amsterdam again? And I think we, like the first point 
Rob uh, mentioned, like how the image of the city changed, I think we should really reconsider that if we still want mass tourism to come in and if uh, shipping via air is still the smartest way to, uh, to ship our goods. Uh, prices for shipping also went, went up, they doubled by uh, seven times. And I think this actually might be a really good, um, a, a good way of, uh, of cleaning the air. Uh, we were polluting the air way too much. And I think we should change our, our, our value. Um, but I'm really curious what's going to happen with, uh, yeah, with, uh, with the international uh, global city concept after, after Corona. Next. But this means that uh, we have reached our uh, conclusion. Um, yeah, our system is at a stress and uh, capitalism, it doesn't work for us anymore. Um, so uh, if it, it wasn't obvious before, uh, Corona made very clear that our system is at a big stress. Um, and Corona wasn't the only warning we've had this year. Um, it's not very hard to pick up the signals anymore. Uh, more social unrest and more natural disasters uh, seem to be occurring every year. Uh, that's quite a pessimistic view, but uh, we like to think about it in, a, in an optimistic way. Um, uh, so uh, what we see that, uh, uh, yeah, uh, more and more our uh, yeah, basic human needs are uh, need to be addressed. Uh, so, and these common values, I think uh, they became really clear uh, during the coronavirus. Uh, first of all, uh, the, uh, good healthcare and a good education system uh, is very important. Uh, a re-evaluation uh, with emphasis on value uh, for people who uh, do uh, priority jobs in our society. Uh, that means the nurses, the teachers, the people working at daycare, but also uh, essential parts of, of uh, transportation. Um, the, the access to adequate housing, uh, and with adequate, we don't just mean a house with a roof, but also uh, its own private outdoor space, uh, plenty of space to, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, to uh, retreat, uh, retreat on your own if you uh, if you like to. Um, it also shows that uh, it's about time we start to live more local uh, in the environment that we could appreciate. Um, so uh, not having to travel for, for hours uh, to your work anymore, but really be, uh, uh, yeah, uh, be able to live for a while in your own neighborhood. Uh, that means creating healthier ways of living as well. Um, and this also means like there, uh, there is a need for a shift in the economy, um, uh, which is also uh, based more locally, uh, living locally and, 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 and working more uh, locally. Um, it's it's um, uh, yeah that one it's it's one type of living and working that comes with more uh, digital and distant ways of working, uh, less pollution and, and more savings on taxes. Um, and I think um, uh, what we also have seen that uh, a lot of people uh, they they work to make money, and uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But in the end, uh, the money should also work back again for the people, and. Uh, We've seen that that, uh, that idea has been in disbalance a little bit. Um, so yeah, embrace your own neighborhoods anymore, uh, some more and make sure that uh, uh, the money you work for uh, makes you happy. Uh, so this means uh, that we come to our uh, final uh, yeah, uh, piece of theory. Get it? Yeah, so like Rob said, I think uh, Corona exposed us uh, it, it showed that we are not valuing the right things in our lives. We are not valuing clean air enough, not valuing sports enough, not valuing our public space enough, while we actually really rely on it. Maybe we are also seeing that we were way too stressed, always rushing in traffic. Um, we, we see a global economy and I think maybe, um, the, of course, that's a good thing. We are talking with a uh, Ukrainian school right now. Um, but um, I think uh, a, a lot of localism is, uh, is, is, is coming back is uh, maybe um, what started being activated during this Corona crisis. Um, 
and yeah, first first of all, uh, people really started enjoying their daily uh, daily environment. Uh, that brings us to this uh, term. It's called solastalgia. Uh, solastalgia is a recently uh, invented word. It uh, describes uh, the emotional or existential distress caused by environment, environmental change. Uh, what that means is that people in a lifetime see their daily environment being impacted, for example, by climate change. We started this year, 2020, by a lot of uh, bushfires in uh, Australia. This is one of those things where people uh, will never in a lifetime face the same landscape again where they live in. And they are grieving in a way, and this grief is called solastalgia. Um, yeah, next. But solastalgia is also caused um, by, of course, a lot of other ways of pollution and climate change and uh, radically changing uh, landscape. And we happen to live in a lifetime where we uh, see a lot of this. And I think right now, we, uh, the, the, this corona crisis made, made us really aware uh, of this. And all of a sudden, we started noticing how clean everything was, how beautiful the sky was. And next. That brings us to my last point, uh, because solastalgia is a very negative uh, loaded word. Solastalgia means that it's some, some things are also irreversible. But what if we put in the term of solastalgia more positively? What if we use this coronavirus to, um, to make those skies more clear again? And like in Delhi or in other world cities, People never saw things as bright during Corona. People didn't know they lived so close to mountains because they've never seen them because of the smoke and pollution. So how can we make from solastalgia and in, in a new recognizing landscape um, where things are more clear, more healthy, uh, where we try to balance our way of commuting a bit more with what's really necessary and what's really needed. And I think everything has already provided for us. We can live way more digital. Um, we can do things way more smart. It will save us time and it will give us a, a really positive uh, solastalgia. Um, so an, a, a positive uh, future and a positive uh, impact on the environment. And I hope we can tell our kids how uh, polluted it used to be and our, how dirty our lungs were in the city. Um, and I hope our kids' reaction will be really surprised and uh, they don't know anything of this. Thank you uh, very much. We are open for conversation. <laughs> yeah, thanks everybody for, for watching. Uh, before we go to any questions, uh, we would like to thank a few people. Uh, Thomas Schleiper, uh, we used many of his images. He shot of Amsterdam during the Corona lockdown. AMP, which is the Dutch uh, news agency, and Amsterdam van Boven uh, for providing all these beautiful images. Um, so now I'm going to close down the presentation and see how the questions are doing. Um, so we have one question from Maria, I see. Um, do you take into account housing on canal boats or is this a very small percentage? Um, so, uh, she as a tourist, she followed uh, the Facebook profile Houseboat Museum. Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, of course, there's quite some people uh, living on houseboats. Um, and, uh, but in a, in a percentage, it's, it's indeed uh, still quite small. Um, uh, within the city of Amsterdam, there's this discussion going on. Uh, uh, because uh, people like their canals and people like their rivers and they're seen as um, uh, yeah they're seen uh, as, as, a, as a common good like a, a public facility you can use uh, many painters and writers have been uh, uh, draw people who draw they've been uh, making paintings of, of, of wide views over rivers uh, so and we so we really like our our rivers um, and the thing with houseboats is, if you put a houseboat in a canal, you will see a houseboat and not the canal or the river anymore. Um, so even though uh, uh, the houseboats we still have, we want to keep, 
and we're thinking about smart ways in introducing them at different places. It's, it's not something that we would like to uh, completely claim all of our waterways. Uh, yeah, again, I think uh, this is... Our talk was about the common values of cities, and I think canals belong to the common value of the city. They uh, are public space. And when people are still living in housing boats, uh, they often uh, privatize a bit of what the waterways or public spaces are. And it exactly is what's happening in, uh, in Amsterdam, where people claim uh, parts of the case as well. So not only the space on the water, but also the public space along the water, blocking the views. And living at the water is great. Uh, especially when our country starts flooding, people will flood with it. Um, but uh, I think um, we should more think about the common value uh, as a city uh, dealing with uh, with housing boats. Yeah, I think uh, house boats boats could have uh, a really meaningful position in housing in the Netherlands uh, because a large part of the Netherlands are below sea level uh, and. That's not an issue yet because we have a quite a good dike system, but um, this is not an eternal system that will live on forever. And also these fields are not going to be used for agriculture or other functions uh, forever. Um, so that could be a really nice solution that if, if we cannot keep that land anymore because it's sinking, uh, houseboats could uh, really be, uh, be a good effective use. So our questions. <laughs> there are there any more questions? Did we answer your question right, Maria? So if that's everybody, then um, uh, then we're going to uh, end our talk now. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it a lot. And um, ah, oh wait, we have another last question. <laughs> um, so this is a question from Katharina. Um, Will the, the, the sprouts and microions will this demonize due to coronavirus sequences? Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean with sprouts, but with microions, uh, I think you're aiming for the, uh, the 50s and 60s housing. We also have in the Netherlands, um, um, uh, larger monofunctional areas with mostly uh, just living, uh, vast green spaces. Um, Amsterdam, a few examples we have of what you could consider a micro rayon is uh, the Belmermeer or uh, uh, New West. Um, whether they will be this demonized, um, it could very well be. Um, I think one reason why they could be become more popular is because the, the amount of green around it is, is, is tremendous and the quality of the green spaces in there are also really good. Um, so that's if I would say for the Amsterdam situation, it's a big plus. Um, the, the, the point that it has it against is that uh, local functions such as shops and working places or other essential uh, functions, um, they're not always in the same neighborhood. Um, you need to travel uh, quite far uh, to go there. So that means that you need to take the car. Um, and that could be uh, uh, in a disadvantage for these areas. But I, I think there's a new appreciation for those uh, areas. There was also a lot of debate in the Netherlands whether people should live more suburban or out of the city, uh, especially during Corona, because cities were especially vulnerable to spreading disease. I'm not sure if this is going to change the, the city model as it is, and masses of people will move out of the city right now. But of course, there is a re-appreciation for the modernistic values. Uh, and the, the, the funny fact is that in the 19th century, uh, people moved out of the city for the same reasons. It was um, like a lot of illnesses, like uh, bacteria illnesses uh, that caused modernism in a sense for new hygienics in the, in the city. Um, the principles of modernism are based on uh, inventing a healthier city. And I think today we see the same things. Um, like the re-appreciation for our daily living environment. So what we experience in our direct neighborhood uh, should always involve sports, should always involve, involve green areas. Uh, the, the sidewalks should be used for more than just walking. It's also a place to stay. So I think, um, I think 
especially modernistic uh, uh, areas with a lot of socialistic, almost communistic values um, in, in terms of urban planning are today really valuable. And of course, the Belmer is one of those um, is one of those areas. It provides enough green for all of the people. Um, but I, I think there's an interesting relation between what happened in the 19th century and now in the in, in this century, uh, we're facing uh, facing these um, these problems. In Amsterdam, they start reintroducing green and sports norms, which is interesting, mainly because the city is expanding, it's growing, uh, but they want to ensure the amount of green and sports. And I think that's um, that's really good. But some areas have already have enough of uh, enough green, and maybe we will start revaluing them after after this crisis. Yeah, to and to yeah, I see it. Uh, but first, to end this one, right? Because uh, will those micro rayons be uh, this demonized due to coronavirus si sequences? Uh, I think it can happen. Um, uh, but it's it's uh, there's one condition I think which is uh, really important. Uh, the walkability of those areas uh, should be good, and uh, your basic needs uh, need to be fulfilled within a walking range. Uh, I think if, if those things are in order, uh, then these micro ions uh, could almost be the future. Yeah, and the car is not sustainable in a model like this. Yeah. Um, only when electric cars maybe are coming. Um, but I think uh, public transport, bike-based, walk-based, um, and the right human scale, because that was another problem in the Belmer city, is that uh, human scale was missing. Um, some of the IUP areas, the general extension plan areas of Amsterdam are uh, feeling a little bit more human. Um, there's a huge park there with a lake. Um, those seem better, better conditions and still uh, you also feel like you live in an urban area with the right amount of facilities and the right amount of facilities can only be there when there's a right amount of density to create them. So. I think that part of the living aspect and living a little bit closer to each other and more density is also creating a, creating those values and uh, facilities we uh, all rely on and why we want to live in a city, of course. So we have uh, another question from Liuda coming. Uh, so Liuda states, she says, uh, uh, we saw the rise of uh, DIY uh, urbanism, do it yourself urbanism. So. Uh, for example, the individual circle spots in the parks and the guerrilla street occupation. So saying tables with chairs for meeting with friends. Uh, thus, could we expect the rise of do-it-yourself urbanism after the pandemic? Um, well, I think we already saw it a little bit, uh, but it was mostly by, uh, by local people who had a, had a strong voice. And um, uh, I think the yeah the, the corona really showed everybody that how important these spaces are. So uh, yes, I would expect to see uh, people um, uh, uh, to go for that uh, more. Uh, I mean, uh, people uh, unite themselves uh, a lot more than uh, before. Uh, also in my neighborhood. Uh, but what we also see is that also uh, local governments uh, have started to experiment with this. Um, since the, 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 the corona crisis was such a uh, crisis situation, uh, also local governments tested, uh, at least in the Netherlands, but also I've heard about situations in Milan and Jared, you probably also know a few uh, examples where local governments started to test with closing down streets, putting down uh, street furniture. Um, and they also uh, uh, yeah, mainly use the arguments that locals have been using for, for decades already that uh, that I, vote, I vote against uh, Rob. I uh, vote against. I I am um, a little bit skeptical about the do-it-yourself urbanism because it's often not reaching the scale um, we should have in the housing production. I think in the presentation I showed how um, yeah how how the housing production in the Netherlands is lacking. Uh, at the same time, we would like to keep the compact city model. So the Netherlands is known for its compact cities and the quality of a compact city is that you can go outside of the city real quick into the green areas and enjoy spending your time there. Especially nowadays when a lot of people have knowledge-based jobs, um, 
who are exhausting their brains, uh, those green areas and the connection with the green and the green fingers going into the city are extremely valuable. Um, with do-it-yourself urbanism, we uh, don't reach, I think, uh, the, the, the optimum in there. I think uh, we need a stronger governmental uh, role in uh, taking back um, at least control of the housing market because there's a shortage and it's a constitutional law. Um, so yeah, I, I think we need to introduce a scale. And of course, when, when, when there's housing of scale and it can be done by do-it-yourself principles, I'm open for all kinds of new uh, interventions, collective forms of housing, cooperative ways of housing, new ways of social housing, uh, that's fine. But I think the, the government should always test those ideas on, on, on the density and the scale and the, the scale of the issue we are dealing with. And so far, I haven't seen good examples in the Netherlands, at least, for do-it-yourself uh, urbanism uh, in, 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 this, in this context. Also because the areas where Amsterdam is developing in are existing brownfields or industrial, post-industrial areas who are redeveloped. The situation there is very complex. So the ownership is really divided. You're working with all kinds of smaller, smaller plots. Um, often this do-it-yourself urbanism is not able to, uh, to start there from, uh, uh, from to start their developing, they're, they're often uh, lacking uh, the, uh, the, the capital to invest uh, because they're too small. Um, but in order to buy out businesses or to transform this area, to clean the area from all the polluted soil, uh, to position themselves in this really difficult area with a lot of different owners, it, um, I, I don't see do-it-yourself urbanism, uh, urbanism happening uh, there, of course. The, the, it, it's always possible within, uh, within, within a larger framework, but I think that there should be a little bit help and guidance from uh, a government first in order to guide this in the right, right way and to secure the qualities you need because we need those green areas, we need those sports areas and facilities. So do-it-yourself urbanism is also not doing that. I think our society is based on good education, sports and green areas. And, um, and uh, then what about uh, the public space? Do you think there, uh, I mean, you showed an example of, of Rotterdam where they took parts of the street um, and restarted to refurbish it uh, themselves. Do you think that's uh, um, maybe a, a better way for uh, residents, civilians to, to have an influence on their surroundings? You can consider that do-it-yourself urbanism as well, uh, but I see that as a bigger program reclaiming the space of cars, which is addressed, of course, by Young Gill as well. Um, we just have to kick out the car uh, at, at some spots. The, it, it's not democratic anymore, the amount of people in a car and the amount of people in the streets or the amount of people biking is not a spatial democratic uh, principle. So, of course, here do-it-yourself urbanism in public space can be introduced to uh, to show creativity and what you can do else with public space other than parking your car or driving your ass around in um, in a four-wheeler of uh, 1,700 kilos. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Liuda, for that interesting question. You can see that we already started our own discussion about this. Um, I see we have another uh, question from Pavlo. Uh, so he asks, uh, if the coronavirus becomes the norm, uh, will the need of communities in public space change? Uh, he also says, thank you for the lecture. Well, Pavlo, you're welcome. Um, well, if coronavirus becomes the norm, that's already quite a statement, I think. Uh, if, if that will become the norm indeed, uh, yes, the need will uh, drastically change. Um, if, uh, well, I'm not, I'm not a medical expert, so I cannot really uh, um, speculate on what it will do to the healthcare system or the uh, or these kind of things. Um, but yeah, of course, the need will uh, will change a lot, and also the public space. Um, and I think it will also make um, uh, problems a lot bigger because 
uh, human life in itself. I mean, it's always, um, since we stopped hunting and we started farming and starting settling cities 30,000 years ago, uh, our existence is revolved about being connected to people, to, to socialize around, to exchange ideas, um, uh, to specialize in something and then to innovate. Uh, that's uh, from the point one, one person started baking and one other person started harvesting. Um, that's only because uh, we got together and started to connect. Um, if we would be in a, uh, in a, in a continuing state in which we need to uh, uh, distance or isolate ourselves from each other, um, uh, it, it would dramatically uh, change uh, yeah, uh, the way <laughs> human life is, is, is developing. Yeah, but, but, but what if you take this... Um, I, I think Corona showed us in, in how many creative new ways we can use the public space. I mean, we saw so many new things happening in the public space. If you go out in the park, you see all the sports schools being located there. I'm, I'm a boxer myself. I'm boxing in a, on a school square now instead of a, a, a hall space, outdoor. Um, of course, we are not allowed to have contact. Um, when, I, when I bike through the city, I see um, all kinds of new public space initiatives. And I think th this can inspire us to, uh, to finally reclaim that space with the, and, and show the creativity of what you can do with that space. Especially in the Netherlands, we are really sometimes really bad in uh, in claiming uh, public space. But I think this showed that people it, like you want the government to fix it. No, no, no. This no. I think the government should provide the public space, and it should be filled in by people. Um, but now we 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 this sparked the creativity. I think the Corona sparked uh, and inspired people. And I think there's a lot more creativity than we can think of in the public space. And we cannot even think of as, as urban designers and we are trained for this, but I'm, I'm really, so this is what I saw in Rotterdam, but this is just one of the examples and one of the many to come. I think there's a lot more to come because now there's something sparked and there is pressure to reinvent. And I think people will only reinvent spaces or reinvent themselves when they are forced um, and and so so now the creativity really uh, really comes. Sports schools they wanted to maintain their clients, so they uh, they invented all kinds of new things. Uh, they exposed themselves. We we see new types of sports. There's an Aikido school really close to my house. They're practicing. I'm interested to watch. Um, the the public space in the Netherlands was sometimes really boring. There's not much happening, especially after six when people have dinner. The public spaces were. Uh, were just uh, empty. Now they're filled with people, people taking their walks, taking breaks from their office work. Um, people are taking calls while walking. Uh, at least it was I was, what I was doing. I'm way more tense than uh, while I was walking in, uh, in an office. I feel more healthy. Um, but yeah, so back to the question of Pavlo, I think um, coronavirus may be become the norm in the sense of reclaiming the space. Maybe that's the legacy. Of course, we cannot speculate about if the coronavirus comes back and if we keep um, being in this one and a half meter society and this distant society. But I think we should uh, really think about what we take from this and inspire people to, uh, to treat their city different. I also see remarks about San Francisco. And of course, this is a huge inspiration where there's even more car space to reclaim than in the Netherlands, but uh, <laughs> it could be interesting. Yeah, and yeah, that's uh, the last comment we got from uh, Lyuda. Um, uh, uh, seems he agrees. Uh, it's, a, it's a good step to kick out the cars uh, that are in, in, in parking spots, and they can be replaced by small sitting areas, places of art exhibitions, um, like indeed in, in San Francisco. Um, I think this is uh, something, uh, well, we have the moment to, to do this now, and implemented more and more. Uh, but I also see that's uh, the last of the comments. Uh, we don't have any questions anymore. So uh, again, I want to thank everybody for watching. Uh, thank, uh, thanks to Connections for hosting. And uh, also thank you, Jared, for uh, talking with me. Yeah, thank you, uh, Rolf. We're gonna tap ourselves on the shoulder. <laughs> Anastasia also 
behind the screens. Thank you for uh, inviting us. Um, it's a really nice way of schooling um, without being physical, uh, physically, uh, physically there and meeting all those people uh, around uh, the globe. Okay, so thank you everybody and uh, have a good evening. Bye-bye.